China is not happy when you know Southeast Asian countries come together and basically build a united front against China. So China sees the Philippines' uh, attempts to do this as as you know a, a threat to China. And this tactic works in the Philippines because there has been rising nationalist sentiments against Vietnam in the Philippines. Welcome to our interview where we explore Vietnam and regional geopolitics. From high profile visits by leaders from the US, China and the Philippines to joint submissions before the UN. Also Vietnam's strategic maneuvering in the region and its ambitious military modernization efforts. We delve into Vietnam's approach to engaging with great powers. We explain the concerns surrounding the hydropower situation in the lower Mekong area. Welcome to the show. Hi everyone. Today we have a guest from Vietnam, although currently he is in Canberra. He's a PhD student at the Australian University. He's also a re research officer in Singapore at the ISEAS. It's Zung Pham. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I became aware of your very interesting comments and articles and interviews on LinkedIn. So yes, thank you very much for your time. And I wanted to ask you about the recent visits to Vietnam in September by President Biden, then briefly afterwards in December by Chairman Xi, and right now, end of January 24, by President Marcos. What does it mean for Vietnam? How, the, how is it balancing all those, let's say, two big powers and the neighbor Philippines? So Vietnam had a very productive year of uh, diplomacy. Um, and as you mentioned, um, there were two uh, major visits recently. So first by President Biden, um, followed by a visit by President Xi Jinping, and recently a visit by President Marcos. Uh, so with the U.S. visit, um, Vietnam elevated its relationship with the U.S. to a comprehensive strategic partnership, which is the highest level of diplomatic status in Vietnam's terms, making the U.S. on par with China, actually. And uh, the two sides also signed several agreements uh, to enhance cooperation across many different areas, particularly uh, economic cooperation and cooperation on semiconductors. And after that, Vietnam seemed to want to balance that uh, elevation, you know, by having China visiting Vietnam and also have a soft upgrade with China. So Vietnam agreed to join the uh, uh, community of shared future uh, with China. And on that occasion, Vietnam also signed many agreements uh, with China. So it seems like Vietnam is continuing its um, balanced approach towards its relationships with the two great powers. And Vietnam is being very careful in how it's it's it enhances its relationship with the U.S. So, for example, Vietnam reassured China that it will continue to uphold its for no policy. So these are no military alliances, uh, no foreign bases, no allying with another country against another, and no use of force in international relations. And you know, it, also with the, the visit by uh, the Philippine president, um, Vietnam also signed two major agreements with the Philippines. The first one is an MOU on Coast Guard cooperation, and the other one is a rice trade agreement. Uh, but it is not, you know, the, the Coast Guard MOU is not something to counter China. It's mainly to uh, the two countries to manage their own maritime disputes, uh, for the two Coast Guard forces to enhance exchange and conduct um, uh, training activities on low sensitivity areas. Uh, so again, Vietnam is also being very careful in how it approaches regional countries like the Philippines. And, and again, it's, it's maintaining a very good relationship with other major powers, especially China. 
I, I think there was also um, a, of particular significance the willingness to explore developing joint sub submission with uh, Vietnam and Philippines on the extended continental shelf yes. for the United Nations Commission on the limits of the continental shelf. So um, previously, Vietnam has submitted one uh, with Malaysia. So may maybe we could talk about that because that's that seems to me quite important and probably doesn't make the authorities in Beijing happy. Well, Vietnam is very interested in resolving maritime disputes with neighboring countries in a peaceful manner. So, you know, as you mentioned, it has submitted um, uh, something with Malaysia. It also has a, an agreement on boundary delimitation with Indonesia. Right? And, and is is perhaps trying to negotiate um, with the Philippines on another submission. So, you know, is is in line with Vietnam's approach towards the South China Sea. Is is trying to conduct nego negotiations with with uh, claimants in the South China Sea, and it's based on international law. It's based on UNCLOS, right? So that's Vietnam's consistent principle: is everything has to be resolved using you know international law and in in a peaceful manner, and of course. Vietnam opposes China's nine dash light claims and you know is is not in line with international law so Vietnam's position is not to recognize that and and a, a way for Vietnam to oppose it is to actually work with other countries in the region to resolve their maritime disputes right based on international law and that indirectly challenges China's claims because a lot of the, most of the areas uh, claimed by China overlaps with with, uh, with um, Southeast Asian countries, uh, EEZ, right? So by resolving, clarifying maritime claims with other countries, Vietnam is, is trying to show China that, you know, you have to uphold UNCLOS, you have to, you know, recognize other countries' legitimate maritime entitlements this is the channel where world's top experts on asian politics and security discuss recent and future events there is also something that i know you discussed in one of your articles that china's wedge strategy that might also affect vietnam and its neighbors or partners could you maybe explain what that is and is it really dangerous for smaller countries, for China's neighbors or not, or can they handle it? China is not happy when, you know, Southeast Asian countries come together and basically build a united front against China. And, you know, potentially, and, and you could see that, you know, with the recent tension between China and the Philippines, China has criticized the Philippines' outreach to um, neighboring countries to basically have a different code of conduct uh, on the South China Sea. So China sees the Philippines uh, attempts to do this as, as you know, a, a threat to China. Uh, China does not want Vietnam and the Philippines to sort of build an alliance against uh, China on the South China Sea. And so um, last year, you know, during July and August, uh, there were a few attempts to contact Philippine scholars and journalists uh, and, and encourage them to publish about Vietnam's militarization of the disputed islands in the South China Sea. Uh, the purpose is to divert attention away from China's actions in the South China Sea and perhaps put the blame on Vietnam. And, and this tactic works in the Philippines because there has been rising nationalist sentiments against Vietnam in the Philippines. You know, of course, the Philippines and Vietnam have their own uh, disputes in the Spratly Islands, right? And attempts by Vietnam to consolidate their claims through um, reclamation and militarization anger a certain segment of the Philippine public. And so 
I believe that, you know, if a third party want to divide the Philippines and Vietnam on the South China Sea, they could incite this kind of sentiments in the Philippines to basically place more attention on Vietnam's actions and portray Vietnam as a more serious threat than China. And I think, you know, the, there there have been groups affiliated with, with China or pro-Beijing groups uh, that have been, been trying to use this tactic, um, trying to contact Philippine um, scholars and journalists to to criticize Vietnam, to kind of divert attention away from what China is doing. Yeah, that thing is going on all over the world, uh, both in the West as, as also here in Taiwan. I wanted to ask you about the next topic, which is the military modernization kind of uh, connected to the previous one. So far, Vietnam relies to 70% on Russia's Weaponry is it uh, the weapon, the the, arm, the arms themselves, the spare parts, repairs, but it definitely wants to modernize, like like the Philippines are currently. Could you tell us a little bit about this effort to walk away from the Russian equipment, and then who would be the partner? Maybe the Korean industry regionally, but is it then more the U.S. Is is U.S. in 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 the game here? So Vietnam faces many challenges in modernizing its armed force. Um, first, like you mentioned, you know, the majority of Vietnamese weapon system is Russian based, and you know, Russia is Vietnam's largest uh, arms supplier. So it's very hard for Vietnam to kind of uh, diversify when you know that you have such reliance on uh, Russian arms. Uh, nonetheless, there have been efforts to uh, explore other options. And, you know, it is in Vietnam's official policy to uh, diversify its, its arms supplies. So Vietnam has reached out to several other countries, um, Western countries, including the U.S. Uh, and also, you know, Japan, South Korea, Israel. And India is also a good option for Vietnam because India also relies on Russian weapons. And so there's a certain level of compatibility, you know, if Vietnam buys weapons from India. And Vietnam has also organized an um, international conference, its first defense expo. Uh, the defense expo uh, was organized recently. And Vietnam intends to organize more, more of that in the future to invite, you know, major companies from uh, Western countries, major defense companies from Western countries, and kind of dis discuss possible arms deals. And I think you know another challenge is the high cost of Western weapons, and so. Like you said, South Korea could be a better option, you know, with with the price being cheaper. Uh, but again, there's the issue of compatibility is still there. Uh, you need to train Vietnamese um, personnel to get used to um, these kind of new weapons, right? Because they're so used to Russian weapons, and they were were trained in Russia. And so it would take a lot of time and, and, and resources for Vietnam to transition away from uh, its current Russian-based weapon system. But Vietnam does recognize that, you know, there are a lot of risks uh, associated with uh, buying uh, Russian weapons, right? Uh, especially with the uh, Russian-Ukraine war. It could face sanction from the U.S. for buying Uh, large weapons from Russia, and you know, with Russia being uh, getting closer with with China, Vietnam also wants to, you know, diversify its its arms supplies. And of course, the the main interest for Vietnam is enhance its deterrence on the South China Sea. So it would want, you know, 
a party that uh, can support that effort and and is you know uh, Western countries, the U.S., uh, Japan, and South Korea can certainly um, help Vietnam in that regard. And finally, there's um, again we have to talk about Vietnam's balanced approach uh, towards uh, great powers. So even though Vietnam is interested in um, enhancing its capabilities to deter China's aggression, uh, Vietnam also wants to stabilize the relationship. It wants a peaceful environment for economic development. So right now, Vietnam prioritizes, you know, having a really good relationship with China. So it does not want to have the optics of, um, you know, buying weapons to counter China. So Vietnam is still very hesitant uh, to uh, buy weapons from the U.S. Recently, there were some reports about a possible deal of Vietnam buying uh, F-16 fighter jets from the U.S. But I, I think this is just, uh, it's, it's not confirmed uh, by Vietnam. It's, it's solely from the U.S. side. Uh, so I think uh, this is actually U.S. propaganda to show that, you know, Vietnam is is getting closer to the U.S., but I think Vietnam is very hesitant uh, to, you know, to upset China, uh, especially one, especially when the relationship is quite stable right now. So the re- is the reason because there are some parts of the Vietnamese military who simply do not want to cooperate with the Americans, or is it more because they don't want to upset China? Because that's that's a bit that there is a difference in those approaches. Mm -hmm. Is it more directed against the US or against China? I think, you know, Vietnam is very pragmatic and Vietnam understands that it needs to upgrade its armed forces uh, to deal with the the threat in the South China Sea. And so I think it's, it's not that Vietnam does not want to work with the US. And, you know, especially after the upgrade, I think there's now... A legal framework for the two countries to, you know, to enhance the defense cooperation. I think the, the, the challenge for Vietnam is to, to balance its relationships with the U.S. and China. And um, Vietnam has learned from the past that, you know, it has to coexist with China. And, you know, because it shares a long land border with China, uh, there's always a persistent threat uh, from China. And so it has to be very careful in how it develops relationship with external powers. Otherwise, you know, China could teach Vietnam a lesson like it did in 1979 with the border war. And so I think, you know, historical lessons play a very important role in Vietnam's foreign policy. And again, Vietnam is also very pragmatic. I think Vietnam is willing to work with 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 the West, with the U.S., as long as it respects Vietnam's political system, and as long as you know um, there are mutual interests for for both sides, uh, and I think you know there there certainly there are certainly interests for Vietnam to diversify its arms supplies, to upgrade its military capabilities, uh, and it's willing to work with Western countries, Western partners. It's just that, you know, Vietnam wants to be very careful in how it develops that relationship. If you believe in me, please like it, leave a comment and share the show with friends. It might not look like it, but I have quite a lot of expenses. I am not asking for money, only for support. The goal of this program is to spread the knowledge. Thank you very much, uh... One more topic, I wanted to ask you about the energy development in the lower Mekong area, because I know you you participated, you contributed to a conference and uh, to an international forum. And I wanted to ask you, what is going on there and how do the countries cooperate? What's China's influence, again, even in the region? How does it affect its neighbors? So on that topic, I look at it through the lens of um, geopolitics, uh, particularly the geopolitics of hydropower, uh, which is the major source of, of power, of, of, of re- renewable power for the lower Mekong countries. 
And I see that, you know, it's a very complex landscape, geopolitical landscape, because you have basically three layers. So first you have, you know, China and the lower Mekong countries, with China being the upstream hegemon, right? So China controls uh, the water flow, you know, by having a geographical advantage and also because it has built 11 mega dams on the Mekong. And China also sponsors a lot of hydropower development in in the lower Mekong countries, particularly in Laos and Cambodia. And people have criticized such a move by China because it has caused a lot of environmental impacts and also it it can has it, it can have security implications for these countries. And another layer is the competition between uh, China and the US. And you know the US has has tried to uh, boost its cooperation with the lower Mekong countries on renewable energy, right? To 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 compete with China. And the US narrative is that China is the bad actor in, in, in the region because they are building a lot of dams uh, that are harmful to the environment. They are cre- creating debt traps with um, development projects uh, in these countries. Uh, so basically the US and its uh, allies and its partners um, are trying to compete with China um, in the lower Mekong region by offering cooperation in renewable energy, in green infrastructure and other development areas. So that's the, the, the second layer. And the third layer is within the lower Mekong countries themselves. You know, uh, there are some competing interests even among the lower Mekong countries. So for example, Laos has built two dams on the Mekong, on the Mekong uh, mainstream. Even you know, even though you know there were a lot of opposition from Cambodia, from Vietnam, uh, from civil society groups in the region, uh, but of course Laos, of course Laos has a legitimate economic interest in building um, hydropower dams because Laos wants to become the battery of Southeast Asia. It wants to uh, use its hydropower potentials to boost economic cooperation and to boost linkages with with uh, its neighbors right so laos has an interest there but of course laos pursuit of hydropower development has has made cambodia and vietnam uh, uneasy because uh, of the of the impacts to the environment and downstream communities and you know cambodia also relies on hydropower and Vietnam and Thailand, even though they have criticized hydropower's development uh, in the region, they also import hydropower from Laos, right? Uh, because, you know, first to ensure their own energy security and second for diplomatic reasons with the case of Vietnam and Laos. And so it's a very complex situation where, you know, you have actors realizing the the negative effects of hydropower, but in many ways, they still have to rely on hydropower for energy security, for economic development, uh, and, you know, for diplomacy. And so the question is, how can these countries get out of that um, situation and, you know, and, and still can ensure their own economic um, and energy security. So I would say that um, it's important for these countries to develop non-hydropower renewable energy like wind power and solar power. And actually there are a lot of potentials in the region for those two sources of renewable energy. So what we need is for development partners like you know, like the US, Um, Japan, South Korea, and even China to offer technological assistance, financial assistance, 
technical assistance for the lower Mekong countries to transition away from hydropower. And I think it's a win-win situation because, you know, it's a healthy competition for China and the U.S. Uh, you know, in providing public goods for the lower Mekong region. And it also benefits the lower Mekong countries because they can gain assistance from these powers and they can also ensure that they have energy security and continue to boost economic development. And But again, we need, I think we need leadership to propose this kind of plan. And I think Vietnam is in a good position to do that. Vietnam is, is the last line in the Mekong. And so it is the most affected by hydropower dams development in the Mekong River. So Vietnam has an interest there. It also suffers from climate change consequences uh, in the Mekong Delta. And so I think Vietnam has to step up and be a leader in promoting hydro, uh, promoting solar and wind energy development in the region. Thank you very much for the extensive explanation. My last question is, what are you recently researching and what should be looking, we should be looking for in 24-25? What's going on in Asia? Okay, so my current PhD topic is um, about Vietnam-US reconciliation, um, basically how the two countries have worked together to address the consequences of the Vietnam War. For example, Agent Orange, uh, unexploded ordnance, missing persons, missing uh, remains of, uh, of soldiers. So, you know, we have talked a lot about Vietnam-US relationship uh, in terms of strategic interest. But I think it's also very important to talk about how the two countries have built trust and, you know, moved beyond the past. And, you know, and, and I think it's, it's important to talk about this, these efforts by the two countries to address the legacies of the world. And, you know, the two countries are actually doing a lot to help with the victims, uh, those who are affected by Agent Orange, for example, or those affected by uh, unexploded ordnance in Vietnam. And I think, you know, Vietnam-US reconciliation can serve as a model for other cases um, in how you can move from enemies to partners. Um, and there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from how the two countries have built trust through cooperation in addressing war legacy issues uh, in the past decades. And, you know, I, I also look at uh, Vietnam's bamboo diplomacy, uh, which is how Vietnam um, balances its relationship with major countries and how it pursues its national interest. And, you know, I think it will be a a very exciting time uh, for Vietnam watchers, you know, with the recent upgrade with the U.S., with an elevation with China, and also, you know, how Vietnam will respond to um, the rising tension in the region, especially in the South China Sea, especially with U.S.-China uh, rising tension in other areas in Taiwan and in technology, right? So. Vietnam is Vietnam has a stake in a lot of these issues, so it's very it will be very interesting to see how Vietnam maintains its bamboo diplomacy, right, and 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 try to ensure that um, it can have good relationships with all major powers and can still pursue its national interests. Zong, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I have so many other explosive interviews on this and similar topics. Please check out my channel.